So in the dreaming stages of our church, um, Cherish and I, Cherish and my wife, uh, we're wrestling with like a vision statement for our church. What's like a, a short synopsis of the vision that we felt like God had given us when we thought, when we felt his call to come and start a storyline here in St. Louis. And here's the phrase that we landed on. You've probably seen it either on our website or walking into the, the through the doors to this building. Um, connecting God's story to your story and the story of our city. Now, um, there, by design, was a lot of things that we tried to intertwine and interweave into this, sta- this statement, but one of those is relationship, all right? So we believe and preach a God who made himself known both through creation as well as his written word. Um, this word became flesh in Jesus, and so we were created for and find fulfillment in this relationship with God. And so this is the thing that we want to highlight in the life of our church, believing this to be true. We want all people to know this very God as well as the work of redemption that he's done in human history in order to bring us to relationship with him. So God so deeply loves us. He desires a relationship with you that he did the unfathomable. There's no other religion that could possibly even fathom that the God of the universe would stoop down and put on human flesh and enter into human society. That's exactly what God did. And then he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He lived the life that we were supposed to live and then he died the death that we were supposed to die. Also that we might have right relationship with him. We want people to know this all throughout our city. We want them to know the good news of Jesus, that he's entered into our world, he's entered into our life, and he did everything so that we may have a proper relationship with God himself. And since we are all created for relationship, it's no wonder, it's no surprise that humanity places that we as people place a high value on relationship, right? So we all live with a craving to belong. Isolation is one of the worst forms of punishment that you can possibly experience in human life because whenever you get into isolation, it's almost as if you become unhuman. We all want a family and a friend group that we belong to, people that know us as well as accept us for who we are. It's something we all intrinsically have desire for and rightfully so. Um, There's a pastor, Greg Forrester, who puts it like this, God made human beings so they can't be human except within relationships. And so there's a, in light of all of this, um, we want people to know that they have a God who deeply loves them and has done everything that he possibly could in order to win a relationship with them. It's been extended to us all by his own work and doing. But There's a challenge, I think, that's going on when it comes to relationships in our society that I think we need to wrestle with. And this challenge is that we deduce relationships down to one thing oftentimes, not maybe all the time, but oftentimes we deduce it down to one thing, and that's our feelings. We deduce relationships down to feelings. You see this in many different ways throughout the way that we live in our day-to-day life. So if you take marriage, for instance, Um, you now have no-fault divorce. What does no-fault divorce leave you to, right? Um, No-fault divorce allows you to exit out of a a, uh, covenantal relationship that you make with another person without having any necessary means by which you have a reason for stepping out of that relationship. So what you hear oftentimes when it comes to marriages that fall apart is that you had a person, a couple, that fell in love with one another, but then they fell out of love, and then they ended the relationship, deduced down to feelings. You can also think about it with relationships in terms of friendships. Um, We all live with some varying levels of FOMO, right? Right? Um, every single one of us, we think about the fear of missing out. And so we have a society that is very, very intolerable to commitment. We don't like to commit to certain friend groups or certain activities because we're afraid of missing out on what might be the next best thing. And so you see this affect relationships within the life of our society. But look, we also do this with God. We deduce our relationship in the basis or the merit of it down to feelings. We often base how we feel like we're doing our relationship with God 
from the most late sensation that we've had with them, whether it be in a Bible study or a worship singing setting. And to be clear, feelings and emotions, they're a part of relationships. They are. They're a part of relationships, but they're one of many aspects. And so if we want to experience relationship the way that God ex- has expressed it to be, specifically a relationship with him, a holistic relationship, we need to heed Jesus' instructions that we find in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, which says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That is the feelings, it's the emotions, so it is part of relationships, but look, with all your soul, like the core gut of your being, with all of your mind, that you think about how, what it looks like to live with this God in this world under his rule, and with all of your strength, Meaning that like your love and your relationship with God isn't just this mental ascent, it's not just this emotional ascent, but it's actually the, the process of doing life with him, working it out with your own strength, living in obedience to him. And so look, this is the goal of our whole series of Proverbs. All right, we've entitled it Proverbs, Life Lived Full. And I want us to be a people who know and live with God holistically, what it looks like for us to embody all the things that Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, that we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And here's what we need in order for us to do that. We need wisdom. We need someone that's wiser than us. We need someone that has thought through these things that can instruct us in how to live in holistic relationship with God, which is what Proverbs is all about. And so over the next eight weeks, we'll look at what Proverbs has to say about a life that's lived full with God here in this world. And tonight, we're going to lay the groundwork for the next eight weeks, all right? So we're looking at the prologue of the book of Proverbs. The first seven verses are sort of like the the introduction, the setting up for the rest of the book. And what we find in here are these string of statements about wisdom and teachings in and of itself. And so what I want to do tonight is I just want to wrestle with these because I think they give us a picture, picture for how we move forward throughout the rest of the book of Proverbs. And here's what I think we find within those first seven verses. In the prologue, we find a few things regarding wisdom, specifically what it is, who it's for, and how you get it. So wisdom, what it is, who it's for, and how you get it. This will be our focus tonight. And if I had a goal for us as we walk away from this evening, is that you'd leave with a sense of hunger, all right? Here's my desire. I want to sort of whet your appetite for wisdom in and of itself. I want you to sort of see a grand picture um, in, from the book of Proverbs, not from me, but from God himself and his word, of what it looks like to live in relationship with God holistically. And my prayer is that we leave in for the next eight weeks and maybe for the rest of your life that there would be this hunger and this appetite for wisdom and how you walk with God holistically under his rule in this world. So for us to begin, I want us to start with what wisdom is, all right? So um, I'm gonna be drawing a lot in this section from a pastor, his name's Jamin Roller, all right? Um, He has been a blessing to me as I've listened to his preaching for a little bit. You may not have heard him. He's not one of those celebrity pastors. Um, So you may not know his name. You may not know any of his preachings, but he has some great wisdom and insight when it comes to the book of Proverbs that I've been personally blessed with. So um, he gives a definition. I want to use this as our working definition for the book of Proverbs when it comes to wisdom. And then uh, I'm going to use some of his language to deduce this uh, definition as well. All right. So here's, here's his definition of wisdom. He says, wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way. Wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way. So there's two parts to this definition. And I just want to wrestle through this together. All right. So let's consider each part for a moment and then we'll bring it back to a whole. So the first one is this God's world. 
At the time that Proverbs was written, there was a lot of different ideas when it came to creation accounts. There were many different myths. Um, One of those was the Enuma Elish, that's the Babylonian creation myth. And they all held in common, like all these different creation accounts, they all held in common that the world was created out of chaos. So this world was created out of chaos because these gods that were at odds with one another had a war and they collided and in the midst of the collision that the world was created. So you have all these, this chaos because of, the, of this world. Sometimes that the world was a byproduct of that. Sometimes it was this victor took the loser in their body and he used the body to create the rest of the world and that's how they deduced that the world was created. So this was sort of what the, in the time of Proverbs, many people in many different cultures and many different religions viewed according to the creation and account that our, our world was created out of chaos. But whenever you come to the God of the Bible, you get a very different picture. And the God of the Bible, you get a picture of a God, this one God in three persons that experienced perfect fellowship in and of himself. And whenever he created this world, he didn't create it out of chaos, but he actually created it out of love and harmony and wisdom. Consider Proverbs chapter 8 with me because it gives a grand scope and picture into what we've just said. So verse 22 in chapter 8 of Proverbs says this, The Lord acquired me, speaking of wisdom, and the word acquired here can also be translated created or made. All right, which is going to make sense as we continue to read. The Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation, before his works of long ago. I was formed before ancient times, from the beginning, before the earth began. I was born when there was no watery depths and no springs filled with water. Before the mountains were established prior to the hills, I was given birth. Still speaking of wisdom here. Before he made the land, the fields, or the first soil on the earth, I was there when he established the heavens, when he laid out the horizon on the surface of the ocean, when he placed the skies above, when the fountains of the ocean gushed out, when he set a limit for the sea so that the waters would not violate violate his command, when he laid out the foundations of the earth, I was a skilled craftsman beside him. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing before him. I was rejoicing in his inhabited world, delighting in the children of Adam. So look, you see a couple of things here in Proverbs chapter eight. One, you see that God is the source of wisdom. Wisdom has a origin point and that origin point or the source is God himself. You saw that in Proverbs chapter eight, that God created wisdom and that God is the one that thought it up, that spoke it into existence before this world was created. But then secondly, that God created the world with wisdom. He created it with understanding. He created it with knowledge. And so God created wisdom and then he used wisdom in his creation. And so look, if you were to view the world as a garment, If you were to view this whole entire universe, all of this world, it's a massive piece of garment. The thread that God used in order to weave it and intertwine it was wisdom itself. Which means this, that whenever you look at creation itself, you can't get away from actually seeing wisdom intertwined in every aspect of our world and our society. If you, you, if you think back to like your middle school days um, where you're beginning to learn what it's like, what molecules and cells and atoms and all these things, um, you can't get away from middle school science without seeing how intricately designed our world is. There's wisdom and understanding that's been woven all throughout creation itself. And so its effects are seen and felt everywhere by us. You literally can't get away from it. It's been so intertwined into the way that God has created this world. Now, this also means that you can't understand this life or this world apart from God's wisdom either. If God is the source of this wisdom and then he used wisdom 
to create this world and it's been interwoven throughout all of society and creation, you can't put understanding or you can't think or fathom what this life is or how this world works without a proper understanding of God's wisdom. In short, it's God's world. And so if you want wisdom, you have to know that it's God's world in order for us to function within the world. But secondly, it doesn't, the definition doesn't stop there. It also says wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way. So wisdom not only is living in God's world, but you also need his way in order to live and function and be within the life of this world. So at times, um, here's what I kind of think we view in terms of wisdom, right? So oftentimes we function with the, wis- the notion that wisdom is a place and not a path. And here's what I mean by that. Um, oftentimes we view that wisdom is something that you uh, excel to. It's something that you arrive at. It's a place that you go. Um, we view this in a lot of ways with like degrees or gray hair, years of an acquired of age, right? So um, a lot of times we think that wisdom is acquired whenever you finally have a wall full of degrees because there's a level of understanding that you've acquired within the life of this world. We also can view wisdom as a place that you arrive whenever you finally have gray hairs on your head for those of us that are still gonna have gray hairs on our head when we get to that time, amen? So in a lot of ways, we view wisdom as a place. But here's the problem with that. When you go and you look at people that have walls full of degrees or people that have retained the gray hair on their head, you still see so many examples of wrecked lives. Wrecked lives that have gotten there because they have not lived with the wisdom that was required in order to maneuver and function in God's world. They have not functioned in God's way. And so what you see in the book of Proverbs is wisdom, while there is a, a, it is true that you can acquire wisdom and it is true that life experience does build as you have more age, as you have more years on this world, but it does not necessarily mean that wisdom is a place that you have to have those things in order to be wise. What Proverbs actually communicates is that wisdom is not so much a place, but it's a path. It's a pattern by which we function in this world. So you, wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way, which is what we see in Proverbs chapter one. There's a few different verses that give a hint at this, all right? So Proverbs 1, 3 says, for receiving prudent instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity. Righteousness, justice, and integrity are ways that we live in the world. So it's a path by which you walk. It's not a place that you arrive, but you live righteously. You live justly. You live with integrity. Proverbs 1, 4 says, for teaching shrewdness or common sense to the inexperienced knowledge and discretion to a young man. It's a way of teaching how you function in this world is what Proverbs 1, 4 is saying. That you take a young man or you take an inexperienced person and you give them the the skills and the abilities in which you can function in this world by way that God has designed it. Proverbs 1.5 says, let a discerning person obtain guidance. So look, for, for us to understand Proverbs, more importantly, for us to understand life holistically, we must know what wisdom is. And wisdom, according to the definition that we're functioning by, is wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way. If you want to make sense of how you live this life, you need wisdom. It was created in wisdom, and then it requires wisdom to function in this world that God has created. And that's exactly what Proverbs chapter one has to say to us. The second thing for us, though, it begs the question, all right, so if we need wisdom to live in this world, then who who is, who's wisdom for, right? Are there certain selections of people? Are there people groups that get this? Does God have like this sense of like, okay, you're gonna get it and then you don't and like we have to figure out how we maneuver and function? Well, Proverbs chapter one also gives us 
a sense of who wisdom is for. And so I'm just going to go ahead and spill the beans. What Proverbs chapter 1 says is it's available for everyone. Wisdom is available for everyone. We see this in verses 4 through 5 in the prologue. Here's what it says. It's going to be on the screen. For teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man, let a wise person listen and increase learning, and let a discerning person obtain guidance. All right, so there's a couple of things that we need to notice here. All right, first, no one is born wise. No one's born wise. Look, Proverbs tells us that wisdom must be taught. It says, teaching shrewdness, knowledge and discretion. For the wise person, listen and increase in learning. Obtain guidance. This means no one is born wise. Wisdom is, it gives us hope because wisdom can be learned. And it also levels the playing field because we all need to obtain wisdom as well. It's not something you're born with. It's not something that these secluded people get wisdom and the rest of the world's trying to catch up. It's not like that. God, God says that teaching, shrewdness, listen and increase in learning, it's not something that you're born into. It's something you have to obtain. But beyond that, we see that wisdom is for everyone through people, the categories, the people categories that Solomon lists here, Solomon lists here, in these verses as well, all right? So Solomon covers literally every person on the planet with the people categories that he gives us, all right? So the first one is the inexperienced, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced. Another way that you can translate this is simple. So if you haven't, if you're kind of getting, you're cutting your teeth and you're making your way in this world, you haven't gained a lot of experience, God's saying wisdom's for you. This wisdom is available to you. He also says the young, knowledge and discretion to a young man. So he's saying like, look, there's never a point that's too early to start teaching or gaining wisdom in this world. Solomon writes the whole entire book for his own son. So it's not for, not, not for the people that have a bunch of experience and it's not for the people that have matured in this world. It's both for the inexperienced, it's also for the young. But look, he also says it's for the wise, Let a wise person listen and increase in learning, a discerning person obtain guidance. So look, there's no other category left to be listed here. Solomon literally hits every single person in this room right here, right now. If you're wondering, well, am I too inexperienced? The simple answer is no. Like the book of Proverbs is for you. It was written for your own instruction about how you live and function in God's world, in God's way. It's for the young person that's just beginning their, their life here in this world. I look at my own kids and like I, I see Proverbs and the book is for them. Solomon wrote it for his own children so they would know how to navigate life in this world out of the life experience as well as the knowledge and wisdom that God had gifted him with. Are you already wise? Well, guess what? The book of Proverbs is for you. That you may grow and continue to gain and learning and understanding. There's no one that has arrived. And so look, if you are to to do like the last two points, um, there's two things that you can kind of leave with this here, all right? First, wisdom has a posture And the posture is lowliness. You can't function in a world that God created in the way that he has created it, the way that he's functioned us, he's created us to live in that by having a proud and high and lofty thought of yourself. The only way that you can function in a world that God has created and in his way is is if there is a humility to you. But you also see here with the whole people categories that Solomon lists here, as well as that no one is born wise, that the pace of wisdom is slow. It's not a hurried thing. You look at the life of Jesus. He's the most unhurried man that you can ever like, think of in the life of this world. You look at his life, and what does the, the Gospels of Luke say about Jesus as he's growing one of the very few 
uh, glimpses that we get into the life of Jesus' adolescence, it says that he is left at the temple by his parents. Makes you feel better about being a parent today, right, dads? Um, Jesus is left at the temple, and what happens within that whole entire story is that Jesus is sitting before those that are wise in the scriptures, and the Bible tells us that he's growing in learning and stature by the day. The pace of wisdom is also slow. That's why you have the young, then you have the inexperienced, and then also the wise, because no one has fully arrived. Which then begs the question too, well, how do you get it? How do you get wisdom? So if wisdom is the ability to live in God's world in God's way, and then wisdom is for everyone, the young, the inexperienced, as well as the wise, then how do you get it? Well, we see the beginnings of it in verse seven. It's the beginning or the foundation of wisdom. And it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. The fear of the Lord is an important theme throughout the book of Proverbs. So it starts the book of Proverbs and then it concludes the book of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 31. You see it as the bookends of the entire book, but then it's also scattered throughout the whole entirety of the book. You see the fear of the Lord mentioned eight times throughout the book of Proverbs. And from it, we learn that the fear of the Lord is the place that the knowledge of God spurs. Fear of the Lord also spurs the hatred of evil, pride, and arrogance. Fear of the Lord is the source of a long life. Fear of the Lord is the avoidance of death. If you have the fear of the Lord, then generally speaking, you avoid an early death in life. And then lastly, fear of the Lord leads to wisdom, humility, honor, and yes, according to the book of Proverbs, also wealth. Not to preach a prosperity gospel, it's just a general truth. So you have this beginning place for wisdom whenever you look at the book of Proverbs, which is the fear of the Lord, but what in the world is it, right? It has a word in here that we just really are uncomfortable with. It's not the Lord, and it's not like an article here. It's the word fear. We have a lot of trouble when you place this whole phrase together, fear of the Lord, so fear, look, here's my working definition of this. Fear is the emotion we experience when faced with someone or something that is bigger and more powerful than us, whether it be real or imagined. Fear is an emotion we experience when faced with someone or something that is bigger or more powerful than us, whether it be real or imagined. Now, if you look throughout the Bible, you get a picture of two different types of fear. You get a picture of good fear and then you get a picture of bad fear, all right? So one of the, the most regularly um, given command in all the scriptures is this, do not be afraid. It's the, it's the most repeated command in all of the scriptures, do not be afraid. We see within the fear of the Lord that there are some that choose a foolish type of fear in this world. It's a fear that causes you to run and hide and you don't have a source to run to for protection. So this fear can be a fear of people, it can be a fear of trials, it can be a fear of death, it can even be a fear of failure. You can fill in the blank for yourself. We all experience fear at some level in all different scopes of life. And the Bible tells us that there is a bad fear because we do not need to be afraid of these things. But then the Bible also tells us that there is good fear because Proverbs 1, 7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So look, there's a good fear that leads to a full life that's lived in this world under the rule of God. And how do you tell the difference? How do you know what's a good fear and then how do you know what's a bad fear? Well, I think sometimes um, a 
picture, whether it be physical or mental, is one of the best descriptors, all right? And so I'm going to give you a little short uh, story from C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. Most of you probably have heard it, but I think it depicts it. So we'll give the picture, and then we'll look at what the Bible has to say about it as well. So in the Chronicles of Narnia, what does C.S. Lewis um, impersonate God as in the book? Aslan, the lion, right? (laughs) <laughs> we got a lion noise. I love it. Um, so what you see within this is there's a scene where the Purvises enter into the Chronicles of Narnia. They enter into the world of Narnia and then meet these live beavers. <laughs> if you haven't read the book, I'm just ruining it for you. But it's also been around for like 80 years. So that's on you. Um, so here's what happens. They enter into this world. They run into this couple. And so they're sitting down and they're getting the whole lay of the land on what's going on in this world of Narnia. And as they're in their home over dinner, they're being told everything that's happening in this world. They hear about this lion named Aslan and he's on the move. And so here's what we see the dialogue look like. So Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. This is what the beaver is saying. And so Susan, one of the sisters says, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And so Mr. Beaver responds, safe, with a question mark. Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So look, here's what separates good fear from bad fear. It's the presence of goodness. Bad fear meets someone or something bigger and more powerful and turns and runs and tries to hide because it does not have a place in which they can hide for a sense of protection. But good fear, fear of the Lord, meets someone bigger and more powerful, which is God himself. But even in the midst of meeting that person that's bigger and more powerful than himself, draws near. You see the difference? Psalm 103 has been really helpful for me in this because I think it gives a great depiction of it. So here's what it has to say in verses eight through 10 and then verse 13. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever, which means that there are times that he is, right? So he's not necessarily safe, But he is good because verse 10 says he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. And verse 13 is like a balm for your soul. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So look, the fear of the Lord is this. It's a good fear that you come confronted with God himself, who is bigger and more powerful than you are, and it strikes a sense of fear inside of you, but you don't run and hide from him, but it's his power and his magnitude that actually causes you to draw near because he's good. You see the difference? So the God of the Bible in Psalm 103 tells us that he's not a safe God, but he is a good God. You look throughout all of the Bible, the scope, all of the narrative that you read through the Old Testament all the way through the end of the New Testament, you see that God is not a safe God. He never calls his people to step into a life of comfort, but he does call them into a good life with himself. And he's the author and he's the provider of that life as well. So one of the things, I'll start to conclude here a little bit, all right? Um, One of the things that, as I was reading through wisdom, is there's often a mental picture that's given, and one of those mental pictures was that wisdom is sort of like a puzzle, all right? So bear with me in this, all right? Some have argued that wisdom is like a puzzle, and you need two things to complete a puzzle, don't you? One, you need the box, like you need a picture on the front box, you know what I'm saying? You can't build a puzzle without knowing exactly what you're trying to build. You need the whole picture to see exactly what you're trying to piece together. But secondly, you also need foundational pieces. You need like the corner pieces and you need the edge pieces that you can build the frame for the entire picture so that you can begin to fill out the whole picture with the other pieces of the puzzle, all right? Now, here's the beautiful thing about our God. 
The beautiful thing about our God is he has not called us to live in this world, his world, and in his ways without a big grand picture or the foundational pieces that we need in order to live within that wisdom itself. And you find both the grand picture as well as the foundational pieces in the same place. And in fact, it's not a place, but it's a person, and it's Jesus himself. See, what God has done is he gives us, through the book of Proverbs, as well as the whole entire book of Scripture itself, he gives us this grand picture of what it looks like to live with God. And our greatest ultimate example of that, wisdom is personified in a person, and it's Jesus himself. If you want to know what wisdom looks like, if you want to know the source of wisdom, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the one that spoke that wisdom into existence. He's also the one that spoke this world into existence. So he's the one that took that wisdom and he took the thread and he intertwined it and he weaved this world together. And so Jesus is personified as wisdom. You look at Jesus and you see wisdom. He's the source of it. He's the one that created this world. He's the one that contrived what it looks like to live in this world. Jesus is the big picture of it, but look, he's also the foundational piece. You look at Jesus and he personifies, he gives us an example. He's the one that lives out for us what it looks like to live in God's world in God's way. Do you need an example of what it looks like to live in God's world in God's way? You look to Jesus. He's the one that put on human flesh and he came and lived perfectly in this world. If you want to look, know what obedience looks like and living according to wisdom, you look to the life of Jesus. Do you want to know what it looks like to live slow and to grow in wisdom from being young and then to being inexperienced and then being wise? You look to Jesus. You want to know what the whole picture looks like? You stand back and then you look at the whole of Jesus' life. Jesus is both the grand picture as well as the foundational pieces that God gives us to live and function in this world. So look, as we're going through the whole of this series, here's what I want us to do. I want us to continue to come back to this picture of the posture of wisdom, which is low, because Jesus humbled himself and he, he took on the form of a servant. Jesus tells us that you cannot walk in this world expecting to be the first. In fact, it actually happens by being the last. And he says, a a student is not above his teacher, meaning that we're going to follow in his steps, meaning if we want to follow and live in God's world, in God's way, we have to assume the posture of Jesus, which was aloneness. If we want to grow in wisdom, if we want to learn what it's like to live in God's world, in God's way, it's going to come at a slow pace. We follow when we model the life of Jesus, that he is the most unhurried person, but the most present with those that are around him. He's the one that gets away from the crowds. He's the one that gets away from the fame. He gets away from the things of this world because he knows what's truly valuable in this life. And it's the relationship that he have, has with his father who is in heaven. And so he's slow, but he's also intentional. He steps in and he invests in what is most important in this world. And we want to keep coming back to this person who is Jesus, who is both the big picture as well as the foundational pieces, because we can't move forward in what it looks like to live a life that's full without Jesus. So here's my commitment to you, is that we're gonna keep coming back to these things. We're gonna keep drawing these out as we're thinking through the big themes of the book of Proverbs as well as the big themes of life. But I ask you to step into this too. Step in and be intentional. Have an appetite and a hunger and a thirst to grow and taste and to take and chew on these Proverbs that we're going to be working through and then thinking through how you apply it to your life. Wrestle through them together in relationship and community group or at your discipleship groups. At home as you're working through your Bible reading plans, as you're thinking through how you pray for one another. Like wrestle with these things whether it be roommates, whether it be spouses, whether it be friend groups, let's step in and be intentional so that we can grow to learn how to function in God's world in God's way. 
It's a lifelong process, but let's step in now because I want us to be a people that live life full as we get in the book of Proverbs. Let's pray.